Welcome to the cutting edge of the global awakening. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence by the military-industrial complex. Well, it looks like the North Tower of the World Trade Center has just completely collapsed. The U.S. dollar's status as the preeminent reserve currency is under attack. This is a mathematical fact. Tens of trillions of dollars are being extracted from the United States of America. You really want the truth? Then just follow the money. Welcome to Follow the Money Radio, a broadcast dedicated to your personal, spiritual, and financial liberty. And now, here's your voice of reason in the midst of global chaos, economist and best-selling author, Jerry Robinson. Ah, uh, greetings, friends. Welcome to this morning's broadcast. So glad that you're joining us. Hope you're having a wonderful weekend already. And uh, we have a really different kind of show today. We're just going to go ahead and dive right in because we are going to begin, first of all, with John Burrs. John Burrs is going to be here talking about market volatility and what you can do to actually protect yourself. He's really done a pretty good job. He's designed these three buckets of financial security. They dovetail perfectly with our five levels of financial freedom. So I think you'll enjoy uh, hearing what John has to say about the current market volatility. We'll also have Jennifer here with our trigger trade report. We had a great week of trades, including one that was up, I believe, 10%. Uh, not a bad trade for the week. And then we also are going to be joined by Tom Cloud. He'll give us an update on precious metals. And then finally, I'm going to play you a portion of a podcast or perhaps the whole thing it all depends on the how much time we have uh whenever i was up in colorado not too long ago I was in colorado springs speaking at the uh, pikes peak prophecy summit that's put on by prophecy in the news uh many well-known people were speaking there uh including chuck missler and stan monteith who we'll actually have on the show uh later uh and then several other big names that you would probably know uh, and anyway, I spoke there, and while I was there, uh, Derek Gilbert, who runs a podcast called A View from the Bunker, wanted to interview me about what I was talking about and how the economy played a role in things related to the Bible. So for those of you who are not into that kind of stuff, if you're not into the spiritual side of this economic crisis, then you can probably skip this podcast once, uh, you know, once we get to that part of the uh, show. But for those of you who are interested in this, I think you'll find this interesting. And so we'll go ahead and uh, get this thing started. We'll start off with John Burrs, and we'll go to uh, Jennifer. She's standing by with the Trick or Trade Report, then Tom, and then my interview with Derek Gilbert, uh, where you'll uh, you'll hear some interesting things, I'm sure. Friends, you have found the only radio broadcast dedicated to your spiritual, financial, and personal liberty. This is Follow the Money Weekly. The best hour in radio begins right now. Well, someone who is no stranger to volatility in these crazy markets is my next guest, John Burrs. He has been in the investment and insurance business for the last 27 years, and he's a good friend of mine. You've heard him here on the program several times talking about retirement strategies, retirement ideas, and he's here today to talk about this market volatility and what he's doing to help clients weather the storm. Hey, John, how are you doing today? Well, I'm doing just fine, and it's a pleasure to be able to have the opportunity to share some of my thoughts with your listeners today. I appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. Well, it's good to have you back on the program. Now, talk about the current market volatility. You've been doing this for a long time, over 25 years. You've seen the ups and you've seen the downs. How are you helping your clients right now? Well, I think there's been a lot of turmoil in the markets lately. And, you know, over the next several months, we have a lot of events coming up that could create a lot of market volatility. I mean, think about it. We have a potential Syrian strike, and the strike against Syria isn't necessarily going to send the markets into a tailspin, but it's going to be determined by whatever response comes as a result of the strike. And, you know, the, the, that response could be several things. could be Syrian uh, with a cyber attack on us, could be uh, Iran, could be Russia even. So, I mean, there's there's several responses that can happen from this strike that could create some volatility in the markets. And then we got 
Uh, ben Bernanke is going to be giving his opinion on September 17th or 18th about what they're going to do with the tapering. And, you know, we got a debt ceiling debate coming up. We've got interest rates that are already moving up, which is going to cause a lot of problems for our government with their debt and unfunded liabilities. And we can't forget Obamacare is lurking January 1st. So a lot of things coming over the next few months that could create a lot of turmoil in the market. Yeah, and I imagine a lot of your clients and those who are seeking out your advice are looking for ways to protect what they have because you focus a lot on retirement planning. Talk about some of the retirement tools. What are you doing uh, and how are you helping your clients right now? Well, the main thing that we like to teach our clients is there's three buckets where they can put their money into. And so just for a minute, imagine three buckets sitting in front of you. And, And the first bucket is the liquidity bucket. And, Jerry, you've done a good job of talking to your listeners about this, and I have total agreement with you that people need to have at least six months of income sitting in that liquidity bucket. And, you know, six months of income, basically, if you make $70,000 a year, you should have $35,000 sitting in that liquid bucket. At all times. And then the, at all times. And that's even before you really start thinking about investing. So that's the first thing that needs to be accomplished. But then if you have that accomplished and you have investments out there, the next two buckets is for that money. And the second bucket, imagine it's a bucket that is called protected growth. And in this bucket, we are going to protect your principal. We want to retain your gains. And we want to guarantee your future income at all times. So that's the money that goes in that bucket, and that's the money you can't afford to lose. And then the third bucket is the risk bucket, and the risk bucket is one that goes, any investment can be in that bucket that goes up or goes down. So basically what we plan for is in your liquidity bucket, you're probably going to earn about 1 to maybe 3%. Uh, in the protected growth, probably anywhere between 3 to 7%. And then the risk growth, obviously, you get all the gains of the market, but you take all the losses as well. So I think a proper diversification between the three buckets is a very important concept to make sure that your financial plan is going to work for you. And let me start a little bit with the risk bucket. The risk bucket can be a good diversification of many things. Um, And again, just think of any investment that can go up or down, like mutual funds, stocks, bonds, uh, precious metals. You know, any of these type of things can go up and down. So that's the portion we want to consider in the risk bucket. But the protected growth bucket is the bucket, again, that we're trying to protect your principal, retain your gains, and guarantee your future income. Each bucket basically has the good news and bad news scenario. So, for example, if you have money in that liquidity bucket, bucket number one, well, the good news is you have availability to get to that cash immediately. But what are you giving up? You're typically giving up gains because if you go down to the bank and put it in a checking and savings account, you're going to be lucky if you get 1%. So bucket two, the protected growth bucket, the uh, advantage of that is that you have the protection. You have the protection of not losing value, and you have the protection of your future income at all times. But what do you give up? Well, you give up some liquidity because that money you can't typically just go grab all of it out of there. And then the third bucket, the good news is, you get all the gains. The bad news is you take all the losses as well, and so what do you give up? Protection. So those are the three buckets that we try to uh, have our investors and clients think about and determine just how much of their money should be in each of those buckets. And like I said earlier, the liquidity bucket's an easy one. Six months of income should be in that bucket. Now, the rest of the money that goes in bucket two and bucket three, I always like to use the uh, rule of age 100. 
And that basically says that based on your age, that's going to determine how much you go in each bucket. So, for example, if you're age 55, then 55% of your money should be in the protected growth bucket. 45% should be out into the risk bucket diversified between different things. And so that strategy seems to work real well. And why it works well is, let's take a look at how the markets have performed just over the last 10 to 12 years. We've had some uh, several years where the market has been really bad. We've had some really good years. So the point of it is, is the volatility is, you know, the the problem, the biggest problem you have to prepare for because there's a lot of clients I talked to back in 2002 when the market was at its low, and all of a sudden their retirement plans changed. And then as the market started to come back in 2003 all the way up through 2007, you know, they finally got all their money back and they're thinking about retiring, and then all of a sudden here comes the housing crisis, and if they didn't uh, – protect the money that they had in two, up to 2007, well, they were quite a bit behind again. And so now we're back to the point where those gains are right back there. So the point of it is, is if your uh, retirement horizon is getting close, more of that money needs to go into the protected growth. Makes sense. So you have liquidity, you have protected growth, and then, you, of course, you have the risk uh, growth as well that you talked about. So if folks want to talk to you about that, I you provide a free consultation. How can they get a hold of you? Yeah, if any of your listeners would like to have a one-on-one free consultation with me uh, to talk about their financial situation, they can call me at 888-914-9909. And I can help make sure that their financial house is in good order. All right. If you'd like to talk to John Burrs and get a free 30-minute consultation on your retirement plan, simply give him a call at 888-914-9909. That is week's trigger trade report i'm jennifer robinson well we had a lot of trading activity in the trigger trade room this week four stocks are still in play including ticker symbol epl which is up five percent and ticker symbol praa which is currently up four percent we sold ticker symbol mu for a quick 10 percent profit in just three trading days We also sold ticker symbol VXX for a 3% gain. Two stocks are still awaiting Jerry's trigger price. Now, trigger trading is a service we offer to all of our FTM insiders in which they receive a trading idea every single day of the week, complete with trigger price, stop loss price, commentaries, and status updates every single day. To learn more, visit ftmdaily.com forward slash trigger trade. That's ftmdaily.com forward slash trigger trade. Follow the Money Weekly presents your precious metals market update. Here's Tom Cloud. Well, Jerry, this is quite a week. I mean, we're waiting on a lot of data. I'm having to record this on Thursday due to a scheduling conflict, so a lot of the information won't be out till Friday, but it's important that you know, our clients uh, know that with all the things coming out tomorrow, certainly Syria, the, the bid uh, vote in Congress, what to do about Syria is very important, and whether the military strike is inevitable or not, you know, one day we think it is and one day we think it's not. I don't think that's factoring a lot into the gold market right now, but what is important is the tapering situation with the Fed meeting just a couple of weeks away and uh, with the unemployment numbers coming out tomorrow, we're seeing estimates that there's an increase to 175,000 jobs in August, but it's expected that the unemployment rate will stay the same at the 7.4%. While all of us know that's not real, 
uh, certainly it's very misstated, probably by at least double that. Uh, that is the official rate, and will have an impact on the markets because if they do taper, everybody expects gold to fall way down. I don't think that will happen, and certainly uh, right after the tapering, within three weeks, we have to deal with the debt ceiling, and we know the debt ceiling will be raised between one and a half and two trillion. And we know what happens to gold and silver every time in history when the debt ceiling is expanding, knowing that all that money is going to be spent. So it's got to be created to be spent. So even uh, if tapering does come along and sends gold down a little bit, because remember, we're not talking about going from $85 billion to zero. We're talking about going from $85 billion a month to 75 or 65 billion a month. So it's really not any major factor. And the other thing you got to watch on uh, Friday when you hear this show is there's a lot of uh, information coming out. The G20 meeting starts, and of course that's always interesting. But the central banks have met in uh, Spain and Europe already on Thursday during the day, and they changed nothing. So that's really a non-event. But what you've got to watch on Friday is you've got the revised productivity and cost numbers coming out, the ADP National Employment Report, and you've got the Job Cut Report coming out. You have the ISM Non-Manufacturing Report coming out. So you have uh, a lot of these things coming out that do have a mild effect on the market, but there's, there's a lot of them coming out at one time. So we're going to keep an eye on that. But the key thing is we moved in to the season. Every one of the timing people that we use has moved into the market. There's not a single gold or silver timer that we have that's on the sidelines. They're all in a buy mode, and we still expect gold and silver by the end of October. While there will be some volatility based on the, the Fed meeting, based on what happens with the argument about raising the debt ceiling, we're still in a buying mode and still expect uh, shortages, especially in silver, late in the year. So I don't think you can go wrong buying right now, but we always try to lay the information out there where you can make the decision, and we're still seeing extremely, extremely bad numbers coming out of France and Spain and Italy, and those are going to be problems that have to be dealt with in the next several months, so they're going to, their bond markets will have to be declared. And, of course, we've got two last things I want to say is two staggering numbers that just came out. One is the FDIC now only has one quarter of 1% to ensure the money that's in our banking system. And certainly with all the bail-in talk going on around the world and you not really being the owner of your own money, which we know is true. Uh, James Sinclair on uh, on his website right now has an incredible video uh, dealing with the insurance in banks. But we know one major bank going down, so this number is kind of staggering. People thought it was more than two or three percent range, and to find out they've only got one quarter of one percent assets to cover the amount of money covered in banks. And then we continue to hear. They're talking about dropping the insurance amount from 250000 down to a hundred, telling you that things are better when we know it's the exact uh, opposite. And then lastly, we, the uh, grading services are continuing to look at the money center banks, and speculation is still out there that some of the biggest banks in the country will get a downgrade by Standard & Poor's or Moody's in the near future. So... All of that would send gold and silver up. So we're just trying to keep our eyes on a lot of moving parts right now, but I'm very comfortable uh, being in both of them. As I said, all of our timers are in them. If there's anyone there that needs to talk to me, they can reach me at 800-247-2812. That's 800-247-2812. And if you're not on our email blast, you can sign up for that free, and we don't share that information with anyone at the ftmdaily.com and go to the Precious Metals button and 
you can sign up. We'll put you on our email blast that goes out uh, two or three times a week. And lastly, uh, if you're looking for precious metals IRA, uh, we can talk to you about that. Uh, very important, we think, with all the talk about 401ks going uh, to be locked in to government securities. A lot of writing about it and a lot of proof has turned up out of archives about the possibility of it. So we're here to talk to you about that. And then, and if you're holding on to rare coins, we still think it's very important that you get out of those as quickly as possible. As we've said many times before, uh, they've been sold by telemarketers at huge markups and have underperformed gold by uh, many, many times. And we only see that market getting worse. So um, and give us a call if we can help you. With this week's Precious Metals Market Update, this is Tom Cloud signing out. Hey friends, this is Jerry Robinson from Follow the Money Weekly. Recently, we have been receiving many emails from our listeners commenting on the great help they're getting from our precious metals expert, Tom Cloud. Gold and silver are excellent hedges against the growing threat of coming U.S. inflation. Who's your gold guy? Make it Tom Cloud. With over 30 years' experience with precious metals, Tom will answer all of your questions. Don't buy your gold and silver through some call center and pay inflated prices. Call my good friend Tom Cloud and speak directly with him and get all of your questions answered. For a limited time, Tom is offering free shipping and insurance on every gold and silver purchase made by our listeners. Call 800 247 2812. And when you do, tell him that Jerry Robinson from Follow the Money Weekly sent you. And he'll throw in that free shipping and insurance on your entire order. Call your gold guy, Tom Cloud, right now for the very best deals on gold and silver coins. 800 247 2812. That is 800 247 2812. <laughs> for most of us to say that we're not really concerned about money until the day comes when we suddenly find ourselves without any. Our guest is an economist, an investor, a serial entrepreneur, best-selling author who hosts a one-hour weekly radio program entitled Follow the Money Weekly. His book, a bestseller entitled Bankruptcy of Our Nation, 21 Income Streams, Pace Investing, and more. It's our pleasure to welcome to the Prophecy Summit at Pikes Peak, Jerry Robinson. Hey, Jerry, to be welcome. Here. Thank you. Um, this is a little bit of an interesting topic for a prophecy summit. Um, is this something that you uh, find yourself doing? Do you talk prophecy, or how does your field of expertise relate to the general theme of the topic here? I was really impressed with uh, Gary Stearman and uh, the folks here at Prophecy in the News for bringing uh, an economic insight to the conference. It seems as if in the past... Um, ethereal topics have been approached and discussed. Sure. But oftentimes the practical uh, is uh, sometimes left out. And so I think economics plays a major role in the book of Revelation. It plays a major role in prophecy. Uh, so I believe that, uh, uh, that this is very fitting. I believe money, in fact, is in many ways one of the ultimate deceivers of mankind, the love of money, of course, the root sure. of all evil. Mm -hmm. But I believe that uh, money itself has become such a chief competitor for mankind's heart. It becomes oftentimes our sole ambition. So having a proper view of money, I believe, is vital for being prepared for the last days. Hmm. Oh, so what would that proper view, how do we prioritize it correctly? Probably understanding that the entire monetary system that we live in is debt-based. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Also understanding that the powers that be uh, do not have our best interests at heart. Understanding that money controls politicians, understanding that mo money controls uh, the media, corporate controlled media, understanding that much of what we hear is not an actual news report on the news, but instead it's just a PR release mm -hmm. put out by a corporation designed to form and fashion our brains. So I believe economics, called the dismal science, helps us to 
basically follow the money. You know, what really is happening? And when we scratch beneath the surface, we discover all kinds of terrible things. Terrible things in the fact that men tend to screw things up historically. We have 6,000 <laughs> years. We have 6,000 years of proof that man can't rule yeah, himself. Yeah. And yet, for some reason, we continue to believe that we can rule ourselves. Well, that's my big problem with the New Age belief. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, every day in every way, we're getting better and better. Well, no, we're not. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing we might be getting more efficient at is eliminating our, our fellow man. Mm -hmm. um, you, you mentioned, the, okay, the, the, the economy of the United States is debt-based. Mm -hmm. uh, our, our basic understanding of, for those of us who studied economics at all, and I've got a BA in economics, is that uh, uh, we're supposed to be able to make a profit. A capitalist system, uh, you invest some capital, you, you build a product or provide a service, and then you get to keep the profit. Um, is that, isn't that how our economy works? It is. Uh, the problem is, is what the profits are made of. They're made of debt. Uh, the entire monetary system itself is backed up by the full faith and credit of a f bankrupt federal government. Uh, the government itself owes approximately seventeen trillion dollars due well, to the. That's only if you use the accounting methods that would due to the uh, national debt. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's that's only you know through accounting methods that would get most corporate accountants thrown in jail. Right. But if you go ahead and include everything, including the unfunded obligations, out to twenty forty. For example, you come up with one hundred and twenty four trillion dollars, right. so you have this massive amount of money that 's owed, and yet you have zero money in savings to pay for it and In fact, the federal government doesn 't owe the money you know we owe the money, and so in many ways, uh, our hope of ever becoming debt free in a debt based monetary system is absolutely positively impossible. Therefore, it requires a shift in our minds to help us understand that money itself is actually being used by the most corrupt institutions of the world to control us. And coming to an understanding of that, I believe, A, provides not only financial liberty, but it also provides spiritual liberty. Hmm. Uh, the other thing that we also find is that our personal liberty is under attack because of the greed and because of the lust for power. And so our ministry is really focused upon financial liberty, spiritual liberty, personal liberty. Liberty, you mm -hmm. know, freedom. Uh, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You know, so we, we firmly take that to be the truth, and that's what we preach. So how do we achieve this, uh, you know, financial liberty and then spiritual liberty yeah. by changing the way we, we view money? Well, let's just take, for example, the, uh, the U.S. economy. Uh, right now, uh, the U.S. dollar is the world reserve currency. Many people don't understand that how it became the world reserve currency was because it was backed by gold. That happened back in 1944 with the Bretton Woods Agreement. Mm -hmm. That broke down uh, in 1971, officially, whenever Nixon took us off the gold standard. But in two years later, uh, Kissinger and Nixon put us back on the oil standard. In essence, they talked to Saudi Arabia, and they said, why don't you... Char uh, uh, basically take all the oil that comes up out of the ground and charge dollars for it only. And if you do, uh, we'll provide you with weapons, we'll provide you with military support, we'll protect you from big bad Israel, who is your enemy, we'll protect you. And all you have to do is price your oil in dollars. Well, by the 1975 came around, uh, OPEC nations, you know, Iran, Iraq, all of these nations wanted in. They said, hey, we want weapons too, we want protection from Israel too, and the U.S. said no problem. You know, all you got to do is price your oil in dollars. That created a worldwide demand. You know, countries like Japan, you know, who are resource poor, they had to come up with dollars in order to purchase oil. Okay, right, so, right. It cre so it creates a massive demand for dollars, exactly what the gold standard had done. Now, that system is breaking down. Uh, Iraq, for example, in 2000, decided to move to the euro. We said we wanted to go and liberate them from terror. Uh, we went in and we reinstituted the petrodollar system after they had changed it to the petro-euro system. Uh, Libya said, let's move our oil sales to gold. Let's not use the U.S. dollar. I think I remember uh, Gaddafi in a rat hole somewhere, and they, they, they had his head, basically. Uh, then, of course, Iran, who is, we're, we're constantly hearing how Iran wants to smoke out Israel. Iran wants to kill Israel. They hate the Jews and all of this. But we also aren't hearing the fact that they have moved away from the U.S. dollar. It's the same demonization we saw of Iraq. It's the same demonization we saw of Libya. It's the same demonization we've seen of all of these axis of evil. Now, someone may say, and this is an example of liberty. This is an example of liberty. Someone, might, some, someone may say, but Iran 
needs to be taken out. We've got to deal with them, right? Especially in the prophecy circle. That's the belief, I think, Mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. prevailing belief. And the question becomes this. Let's take a look at one of our best friends in the in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia. Uh, if you convert to Christianity, you have three days to repent, mm-hmm. or you're going to be beheaded. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, there is no freedom of press. There is no freedom of religion. There is no freedom of speech. There is no democracy, and they hate democracy. Mm-hmm. There is no love of Israel. They hate Israel. There is no uh, disdain for nuclear weapons. 2011, 2012, 2013 New York Times shows us that they're trying to get nuclear weapons. So pray tell me the difference between Saudi Arabia, who is our best friend in the, in the Arab Middle East, mm-hmm. and Iran. Well, Iran's a democracy, uh, maybe just in name only, but at least they have tried to cling to democracy. So the, the U.S. in many ways is a very deceiving empire in the fact that it, 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 it pervades uh, the media with all kinds of images and demonizes the people that it wants to demonize. And then people like you and me, we walk around and regurgitate what we hear in the media, sure, right. not based upon fact but based upon what they want us to think. If you want to deal with the Middle East, deal with all of it. Uh, Don't just pick on certain countries that choose not to take your dollar. By the way, Saudi Arabians use our dollar. We love the Saudi Mm -hmm. Arabians. And then they turn around and they buy weaponry from the military-industrial complex here in the United States, which then amounts to essentially high oil prices Mm -hmm. going back to the 1973 uh, uh, agreement becomes a wealth transfer, an involuntary transfer of wealth from American taxpayers through the petro shakedoms back to American military suppliers. And even into the bond market. They actually, that petrodollar recycling, they get the, the dollars, and then they place it back into J.P. Morgan. They place it back into these banksters that run America. Hmm. So it's a real convenient thing, I think, that many Christians have been co-opted by the mainstream media. They've been co-opted by, many times, Washington to have a desire to, to kill and maim Iranians. But they often don't realize why. Why do we want to do that? We want to do that because of the petro-euro system that they're mm-hmm. using. So, for example, next week the Congress will be passing a bill, no doubt they've already got enough support for it, to cut off all of Iran's oil exports. Now, I'm no friend of Iran, but I'm also no friend of Saudi Arabia. And it's it's unfortunate that the, that America is, especially when you consider that 15 of the 19 yes. hijackers yes. on 9-11 did not come from Iraq. They did not come from Afghanistan. They did not come from Iran. They came from Saudi Arabia. Yes. So it seems to be a very backwards kind of world that we're in. And when we when we simply believe what the media tells us, I believe we are actually operating in great deception. Yeah. Uh, about the time that Libya was about to be liberated, uh, there were some reports that had come out through uh, not the, the, the most widely distributed mainstream news sources, but there were some reports that, were, uh, uh, re- that indicated that uh, Colonel Gaddafi was uh, negotiating with the Chinese to uh, bring them into uh, some exploration agreements with, uh, with the country there. Mm-hmm. Uh, coincidence, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you attach any significance to... Uh, the fact that the very first act of the uh, rebels, once they liberated Libya, was set up a central bank? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no, no. no, that's how these guys work. Yeah, it, it's, the, it's, the, very, the very first act in Iraq was right. the same thing, to move off of the petro-euro system back to the petrodollar system. Right. All of the oil being pumped out of Iraq right now is based on dollars. Hmm. It wasn't until we invaded. Yeah. So then, how, and, how did, and let me explain why that's important. Because many people who are watching this maybe say, "Well, what does that matter? Who cares what currency they use?" Well, the Federal Reserve is printing a trillion dollars a year. They're printing eighty-five billion dollars a month. They need a permission slip to print that money. You can't have a permission slip to print money if you don't have a global demand for the money. Mm-hmm. And if you allow one actor in the Middle East to violate the petrodollar system and not use your dollar, then what prevents another one? from doing the same thing, and then another one. Then you have a domino effect. Mm -hmm. This is what U.S. is trying to do in the Middle East. They're not trying to solve the Middle East. I I don't believe that what we're seeing in the United States is a planned destruction, as many people believe. Many people take a look at the economy in in the United States and say, well, Obama is trying to destroy the economy. I think it's quite the opposite. I think that what they're trying to do is they're trying to hold this unbelievable 
huge empire with 900 military bases, and it's just spread out all over the world. They're trying to hold this thing together, and they can't. And it's breaking down before their eyes, and so they're going to resort to war. This is exactly what they always do. Uh, China and Russia are really our main enemies. Syria and Iraq are in Iran, the proxy mm-hmm. wars that we fight to get to them. Okay. Um how do we benefit, or how do these, the banksters and their, their uh, allies in the military-industrial complex then, benefit from taking the war to Syria and Iran? Well, Syria is a terrible tragedy. Uh, basically, the latest report that's out shows that nearly 100,000 souls have been killed. Yeah. Now, I think in the West, we like to think in our minds that those are rogue uh, you know, Syrian army uh, folks who are wearing fatigues and they have weapons. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Unfortunately, it's women. Unfortunately, it's children. Unfortunately, it's infants. Unfortunately, it's many people that you and I would say, how in the world can we see those people killed? Yeah. The problem is that the United States has not only facilitated these deaths, but they've also provided financing. And on top of it now, they're providing weapons. And they're not providing weapons to just... Uh, you know, a, a rebel group that's popped up in Syria. They're providing weapons to Al Qaeda. They're providing weapons and financing to uh, the Al Nusra Front, which is part of Al Qaeda. And it makes you wonder imagine if Canada, for example, got really mad at us and they said, We're going to send Al Qaeda folks down to Chicago and we're going to give them military arms and financing because we really think Chicago needs to change its ways. Yeah. I think. People dying on the streets every weekend in Chicago. Yeah, yeah. yeah we need to fix it. We need <laughs> right. to fix it. Right. And you know, we can't have this next to us. We got to fix this. I think most Americans would be irate. Sure. Now we have the equivalent of almost two 9/11s occurring in Syria every single month, and that money is coming from us. Therefore, the blood is on our hands. Mm. We must stop this military aggression that we're showing in the Middle East, and we have to understand that it's motivated by economics. It's not motivated by some sort of uh, spiritual uh, guidance that we want to protect Israel. Israel can protect herself. She has more nuclear weapons than the entire Middle East combined. We know this to be fact. She can protect herself, and she will protect herself. We know that. Mm -hmm. She won't hesitate to protect herself. But we have vested interest over there. We have national interest over there. And we need to we need to get ourselves out of that area. Well, let, let's step back and bring this closer to home again. How does our understanding as Christians, looking at this situation, understanding that the banksters, the military industrial complex, or military intelligence complex, whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. um, has a vested interest in taking our money and applying it in ways that we don't want it applied? What do we do about it? How do we provide for our families, knowing mm-hmm. that we're part of this system? Yeah, I think that's the main thing, because what happens to many people is they find themselves on the Titanic. They see that we have this $124 trillion national debt when you add everything in. They see the fact that we don't have any money to pay for things. They see that we're all spread out across the globe. They see these atrocities that are going on around the world in their name, and they say, what can we possibly do about this? Imagine you're on the Titanic. This is kind of what people feel like. They're sailing along. They hit the iceberg. What many people have opted to do, and we've seen this with the Tea Party, and we've seen this with other types of groups, they want blood. This, the ship is sinking, and they want to find out who was driving the boat so they can go up there and spend their remaining hours of their life beating him to a bloody pulp. Sure. Right? They, right. Want, they want revenge. Well, unfortunately, uh, that's not a wise use of time. Uh, instead, what we need to be doing is hopping into a lifeboat, getting our family in that lifeboat, getting our friends and loved ones in that lifeboat, and getting the heck out of Dodge. Mm-hmm. The, the Titanic is sinking. The way we do that is we, first of all, we gain liberty in our minds and understand that the mainstream media, doesn't matter if you're watching CNN or Fox News, there is no difference. They're all owned by corporations. Mm-hmm. And we realize that these corporations have one thing in mind, and that's profits. Yeah. So we extract ourselves from that. And we begin to realize that we have to begin to take action on the part of our family. We have created so many different things on our website. We have over a 1,000 articles on our website, ftmdaily.com, tons of free materials on how to, how to break free. But, I mean, just to give you a couple examples, we have over 22 income streams that people can create both now and in retirement. The average person has two. Uh, we, wanna, you know, we, we show 22 different income streams you can have. Uh, we, many people uh, have no idea how to invest. We provide great investing resources on there. We teach something called PACE. 
precious metals, agriculture, commodities, and energy. These are four areas that outperform in times of crisis. So we have the PACE investment portfolio up on the website, and it's also in our book, Bankruptcy of Our Nation. We also talk about the importance to diversify using you know, gold and silver with our savings uh, and not being over-leveraged in U.S. dollar-denominated assets. Most people have almost all of their money in U.S. dollars. Yeah. Uh, there could be a banking holiday. There could be something along these lines. And it's that stuff gets spooky. Sometimes people get really bent out of shape and they start coming up with all this conjecture. But the truth is is that a banking holiday has occurred before in the past, and it could happen again. And the way that the, the United States would probably stage this, and they will stage it, they won't hesitate to stage anything, yeah, that what they would likely do is they would probably have some sort of cyber attack, maybe China, you know, China you know, commits a cyber attack against us, and they have to close the banks. So they close the banks, and then they, you know, that happens on a Friday afternoon, conveniently. And then they reopen them on Monday, and you're more than welcome to come to the bank. You just can't get all your money out. You can get $500 mm-hmm. out. So it's important, I think, to have um, an exit plan before you need to exit. Uh, if you don't necessarily need it, uh, then fine. And I think that one more thing along these lines, um, many people uh, probably listening to this broadcast uh, approach Bible prophecy from a pre-trib uh, viewpoint. I think that's probably a given. And that seems to be the prevailing uh, At type. this conference anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I would say that, uh, that what if we're wrong? What if we're wrong about that? Uh, I think it probably is wise to use the old adage, uh, to prepare as if he's coming today, mm-hmm. uh, uh, but uh, or I'm sorry, you know, well, yeah, live as though live he's as though he's coming yeah, today. Yeah, right. But uh, prepare as if he's not. And I think it's the same way with this. We should probably not think that we're just going to zip out of here before any problems occur. We really need to take our finances seriously. These things require thought. They require us to really sit down with our families and make a plan. And uh, we provide all the materials that people need to do that on our website and in our book, Bankruptcy mm-hmm. of Our Nation. Now, again, pace investing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, uh, the the sectors that you mentioned, mm-hmm. uh, pretty much uh, recession-proof? Oh. Precious metals, agriculture, commodities? Uh, yeah, energy. I mean, they certainly go up and down. Uh, even in times of recession, you know, certainly they go down. But I think overall, these are areas that outperform in a time of hyperinflation or in a time of great economic crisis. And precious metals, for example, you know, you want to own the physical metal. You want to have that in your possession. Uh, when it comes to uh, agriculture, many people have done very well with farmland. Farmland has mm-hmm. been something great. You buy the farmland, you rent it out to to a farmer. Yeah, uh, there, there have been stories, in fact, in recent years of uh, investors going up and buying it up farmland in places like uh, you know South America over yep. uh, some yeah. uh, very well known aquifers down there, and in, in, in Africa buying yeah, farmland and, and because it. the farmland in the United States has become so expensive, they have to right, go right. You know, offshore. But you know, I think the farmland's kind of becoming a bubble now, so maybe a better way to play it would be a direct play on food, maybe you know using ETFs or, or stocks and companies that you know we've done very well with food stocks. You know, food stocks have just been doing great. Uh, commodities, you know, things like steel and copper, you know, you can play these. But energy, I think, is another bright spot. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's certainly ways to play that. Obviously, people with money can go out and buy an oil well and then get royalties. Yeah. But the average person can only buy ExxonMobil or Chevron or something like that. Or maybe they can get involved, uh, you know, maybe in a, uh, in a, uh, uh, you know, a, some sort of type of MLP, like a master limited partnership, which is a, a very high dividend paying type of uh, energy uh, stock. Uh, that uh, that throws off a lot of uh, of income. So these are the type of ideas I think that most people uh, would benefit from. And I think the other thing uh, is the idea of multiple streams of income. It's mm-hmm. so vital. When you read about Abraham, for example, he was rich in gold. He was rich in silver. He was rich in uh, cattle. He was rich in uh, slaves. You know, he was a business owner. I mean, that's what we would call him now. And uh, this is uh, these are the things that I think many people need to be thinking about. How can I create multiple streams of income? Mm-hmm. Many are very dependent upon one stream of income. Yeah. maybe two. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, j- j- just as a, a a bit of a rabbit trail, and this is just my own per- personal curiosity. Yep. Living in um, East Central Illinois, mm-hmm. the area of Illinois south of of where I live. Mm-hmm. Uh, which was kind of eye-opening to me because I, I grew up in Chicago. When you grow up in Chicago, you think nothing happens in Illinois, Illinois south of Interstate 80, you know, right. Joliet, um, as I've been reminded repeatedly by the fellows that I meet down in places like Marion and Mount Vernon, Illinois. Right. Uh, 
the words oil and boom are being used in the same sentence in those places in southeastern Illinois, mm -hmm. uh, places where they've been drilling for 100 years. Mm -hmm. uh, but new technology is opening up new shale plays that were not available uh, 100 years ago. Um, and there are other places across the country where this is happening, North Dakota in particular. Uh, are, are these, uh, are, do these present any opportunities to the average investor? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's been definitely great plays on these areas down in Texas, even in Arkansas. There's the, uh, f uh, there's the Fayetteville uh, shale down there. And then, of course, you have uh, uh, the one up, the big one up in North Dakota. The, the, the Bakken. The Bakken uh, yeah. yeah, the Bakken fields. Yeah, these are, these are obviously very, very good. Uh, you know, the United States is very well entrenched into an oil-based infrastructure. And although shale uh, can be converted into oil very easily, uh, it's, and I say very easily, relatively speaking, but it's a, it's a much different process. It's much easier to buy it from the Saudis than it is to have to extract right. it and do it ourselves. It's more costly. Right. Um, so I, I think that the... Uh, uh, that there's this kind of inertia in in uh, the United States to actually do something here in our own uh, domestic oil production to eliminate the need for foreign oil. Unfortunately, based on all the studies I've seen, and I know that there's a lot of different studies out there, when we did a big study on this for our book, uh, the United States, we don't have the type of setup that many people would think would allow us to move to a uh, totally de great dependence, uh, independence uh, from foreign oil. Mm -hmm. We do have the natural gas to pull it off. We don't have the oil to do it. And many people would, would disagree with that. They would say, look at this and look at that and look at this. But what they often fail to consider are, A, uh, the absolute cost of uh, extracting it. Right. Uh, B, uh, the amount of water and other types of energy that are required. There's something called ERREI in in uh, in the oil area. It's called energy return on energy invested. Mm -hmm. And at some point, it takes you more than a barrel of oil to pull a, a barrel of oil out of the ground. Mm -hmm. And when you reach that point or you even get close to it, guys throw their hands in the air sure. and say, you know, call Saudi Arabia and tell them to send more oil. Yeah. So uh, I would say that, yes, it provides opportunities, but they are going to be short-term the long term is going to have to be natural gas. Okay. Just, again, yeah. just a point of curiosity. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, one of your presentations here at the Prophecy Summit is uh, is titled Uncovering the Mystery of the Federal Reserve Bank. Mm -hmm. What is mysterious about the Federal Reserve, and what should we Americans know about it? Well, the Federal Reserve Bank is a fraud. It was uh, created in 1913 through an act of Congress. Uh, many people who don't know the story should read a book called... Uh, the creature from Jekyll, Jekyll Island, Island, right? Yeah, yep. by Geo or Griffin. We've had him on our program, you know, several yeah. times. I had the opportunity to interview him. Too. Yeah, he's, he's a great interview. Yes. Yeah, he does a great interview. And uh, and the the Fed again. This has been said over and over, but it's not federal and it has no reserves. Um, the Federal Reserve, in essence, is a private institution that has zero accountability. It has zero oversight. Uh, we have numerous videos on our website, ftmdaily.com, of case in point of the Federal Reserve being in front of Congress and having zero answers to questions that we should expect as citizens to, to have from a central bank. If you're a bank and you want to make profits, do you want to lend to somebody like me or you, or do you want to lend to Walmart? I think you want to lend to Walmart because right. you're going to get a lot better return and you're also going to get a guaranteed return sure. almost. A lot of now, assets to back it up. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, if you're a bank, do you want to lend to Walmart or do you want to lend to the United States government? Well, it all depends. It all depends. Does that government have a federal income tax where the government can actually stick their hands into your pockets, pull money out by force, and then give it to the banksters? Mm -hmm. If they do, then the bank wants to lend to the government. So in 1913, they passed first a federal income tax. Then came the Federal Reserve Act. And that allowed then a guarantee to be made to the bank. Don't worry. We're going to borrow from you, and we'll pay you interest. And if we ever can't come up with cash, cough it up, you know, we have this income tax. We can always go extract from the, from the people. So the Federal Reserve, in many ways, is unnecessary. It's a fraud. Um, Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution says that the United States has the permission, the Congress has the express permission to coin money and regulate the value thereof. It never gives the Congress the ability to outsource uh, that, that uh, certainly, and certainly not to a private, uh, autonomous uh, banking uh, system 
that is known for its corruption uh, worldwide. Uh, the Federal Reserve has a lot to answer. Over $9 trillion has left our economy, has left their printing press to foreign banks. Uh, part of, of the bailout that occurred back in the in two thousand and eight two thousand and nine, uh, there were all kinds of unbelievable reports coming out from the Congress and no answers. So the Federal Reserve is an absolute fraud and needs to be ended. And the, what you would have to do is you would have to basically take that back to Congress. Now Congress doesn't want the Article One, Section Eight, because they realize that if they if they actually coin the money. Well, A, if you coin money, what are you going to coin it out of? What did George Washington say? Gold and silver. Yeah. And he passed the Coinage Act of 1792. George Washington said this whenever he signed the bill. And the bill reads this way. If anyone ever creates paper money, ever, let them be hung. Hmm. Hang them. Hang them. It's death penalty. Currency Act of 1792. Well... Now his picture, you know, it graces the face of uh, of the of the uh, one dollar bill. So he, you know, he would actually have hung somebody for making that dollar bill. <laughs> and at the very top, it says Federal Reserve Note. Now that should tip us off. It used to say Silver Certificate. Now it says Federal Reserve Note. If I say I have a car note, does that mean I have a, an asset? Maybe, but I certainly have a loan. So a car right. note means I have a car loan. Uh, if I have a Federal Reserve Note in my pocket, it means I have a Federal Reserve loan. Here's the big secret that the Federal Reserve doesn't want you to know. They loan the dollars to the government. The government then puts those into circulation, and then we use them. But they all have to be paid back with interest to the Federal Reserve. Hmm. Who creates the interest to be paid back? The Federal Reserve. They set the rate, don't they? No, the interest does not exist. This is why bankruptcies and foreclosures are built into the system. So if, if we say... If we say we need we need 10 million Federal Reserve notes, no problem. So we issue the bonds, and then we get the money from the Fed. The Fed gives us the money. Now, they say, no problem, we'll give it to you, and we're going to set our own rates, and we need you to pay us back 3%. Well, we've only got the amount of money they gave us. Where do we get the interest from? The interest does not exist. That's where fractional reserve banking comes in. Yeah. Okay. And so there is no interest to pay back. Therefore, you have to have foreclosures. You have to have bankruptcies. You have to have defaults because it's a game of musical chairs in this fractional reserve banking. There is not enough money in the system to pay off all the debt. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Federal Reserve knows this, and the Congress knows this. At least some of them do. Uh, but, you know, you'd be surprised because it was probably 20 or 30 years ago there was a survey done where uh, congressmen were asked, you know, is the dollar backed by uh, uh, gold? And, you know, most of them thought that it was. And this, of course, was way after the fact that it wasn't. So I would say that many of our congressmen, many of them may be malicious, but I'm sure many of them are just ignorant. Huh. And if we follow the money, the foreclosures, the bankruptcies, uh, basically then uh, put assets into the hands of the banks, does that indicate then that the privately owned banks that wind up holding on to these, uh, uh, these, these assets that uh, people had to give up are the true beneficiaries of the Federal Reserve System? Yeah, they're the owners of the Federal Reserve System. Yeah, they own the Federal Reserve. Okay. Um, now, there are eight families you know, that, uh, that many conspiracy, conspiracy, conspiracy theorists get into and talk about the Rothschilds and the, the Rockefellers. And there's no doubt. I mean, these guys own the banks. There's no doubt about it. But many people fail to realize that banks like Bank of America and J.P. Morgan and, and uh, you know some of these others, they have a tremendous amount of ownership in the Federal Reserve. And uh, you know, their principles are benefiting from that. But you're right. It's a way of confiscating wealth. Because the defaults have to happen, it moves those right back to the bank. So it's a constant uh, shell game where they're winning and the American public is losing. So then doesn't it benefit the Federal Reserve and thus the bankers for the United States to continue to run a deficit and increase the deficit year after year after year? Absolutely. Yeah, and how do they do this? They want war. This goes right back to what we started talking about. Uh, Central banks love war. Banks love war. Because, if look, if you have a government, you need them to borrow money. They need to be constantly needing money. Now think about the military-industrial complex you talked about earlier. These these companies, these defense contractors, which are the scum of the earth, absolutely positively the scum of the earth, uh, they design weapons to kill people. Right? They're pretty bold about it, mm-hmm. and they it's like a hot dog stand. I mean, it, how many hot dogs do you make before you have to sell one? 
right? You have to sell one eventually, don't you? And especially if you have a publicly traded stock. Mm-hmm. I mean, you got shareholders who are saying, "Hey, you know, how many bombs did you sell this quarter? So how, you know, how many of your uh, different, uh, you know, gadgets and stuff did you sell?" So they have a constant pressure to sell these weapons. That's why we see the proliferation more weapons on this planet now than ever before, and it's growing unbelievably. And of course, they own the media. The, co- the corporations own the media. And there is no freedom of press in the United States, except for the the uh, alternative media that we have, like World Net Daily and some of these other outfits. You know who's you know Joseph Farah is here. Mm-hmm. These uh, are the champions of our uh, of our uh, of our press today. We need to support alternative media. But but back to the military industrial complex. They make these bombs. They make these weapons. They have to be deployed. So the United States has to go out and drop bombs on on uh, in the ocean for for drill practice. Or they've got to go drop them on a country, but they've got to use them because they have a shelf life. So uh, it's a very perverse system. And what's so what's what's so terrible is the fact that somehow, and I don't know how this happens, but somehow the Christians get co-opted into this whole system of believing that we need more war and believing that we don't need to have transparency in the Fed and believing that that the banksters are not out you know, to mm-hmm. to to do us any harm. Uh, there some sort of mind game that occurs somehow and so when the christians are co-opted into it that's when i get upset yeah, you know it's yeah. i expect the world to be deceived but when the christians themselves are pushing the agenda of the military industrial complex right. and pushing the agenda of the banksters so, somebody's got to realize that that's wrong yeah you know? uh, that's right dominion yeah. theology is one of the few things that really makes me angry because yeah. you're right uh, you know jesus never told us we were to uh, go forth and, and spread the democracy to the ends of the earth it was to uh, go go forth and, and preach the gospel to the ends of the earth uh, jerry robinson is the host of the one-hour weekly radio program entitled follow the money weekly best-selling author of the book bankruptcy of our nation 21 income streams pace investing and more I know we've only scratched the surface mm-hmm. of the topics that you can touch on, but sure. uh, um, you know, short of talking all night, uh, we'll have to end it here. Uh, how do people find out more about your work, your writing, and your show? Yeah, they can go to our website. It's fo- they can just type in followthemoneydaily.com, ftmdaily.com. They can find us there. Uh, we can, they, over a thousand articles there, tons, so probably three years of archives of radio shows. Uh, we have a newsletter that's available, a daily e-blast that goes out providing economic updates for Christians. They can sign up for it there. But FTM Daily is the best place to go. All right, Jerry Robinson, thank you very much for your My time. Pleasure. appreciate the opportunity, and I look yeah. forward to getting that daily uh, newsletter, which I signed up for just before we uh, went to air here tonight. <laughs> From the Prophecy Summit at Pikes Peak, I'm Derek Gilbert. The views and opinions expressed by the guests on Follow the Money Weekly do not necessarily represent the views of FTMDaily.com or Makers Group Financial, LLC. Even though these are proven strategies, Jerry Robinson is not a financial advisor, and his guests are not legal or tax advisors. You should always consult a trained financial advisor and or tax advisor before making any financial decisions. John Burrs is a registered representative of and does offer securities through Psychor Securities Incorporated. Lifetime Decisions Management Incorporated is not a subsidiary of nor controlled by Psychor Securities Incorporated.